So hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and open to the book of Philippians, to Philippians chapter 1. Uh, we are continuing our series that we've been in for about the last month, entitled Transcend, and we are learning from Paul's writings, the Apostle Paul, who is writing to a group of people in, in a city called Philippi, where's, where there's a church that he helped plant and some powerful things that have happened there. He's writing a letter to them of encouragement because he's writing from prison uh, and he's writing to a group of people who are being persecuted for their faith. And so he's writing about suffering and he's writing about joy and all these things. And so this morning we are going to talk about everybody's favorite topic. And the reason you come to church is to talk about suffering, right? Suffering. In fact, we're going to get to verse 29 in the passage. We're going to look at verse 27 to 30. And verse 29, I have yet to meet anybody ever who said, this is my life verse. And you'll get it when we get there. But suffering, you, have to, you and I have to understand, suffering is something we want to avoid, but suffering is a guarantee. As, be, as a part of being human, suffering is a part of the equation. As a follower of Jesus, suffering is a part of the equation. What is not a guarantee is how you and I respond to suffering. How we run from it, or we avoid it, or we get mad at it, or we give in to it, whatever it is. It's the way that we respond, and this morning we're going to talk about that. Paul kind of highlights that, because this is the way that God has wired it, and if you are God, and maybe someday when you're in heaven and you talk to him, you can try to correct him. It won't work, but God has made suffering a part of the way that he develops us in this life. And we don't like that. We would rather be God and make it rainbows and candy and flowers and all of these nice things. And God uses this thing called suffering to actually shape us and to develop us and to strengthen us. In fact, it's not even, it's not even exclusive to human, human nature. It's a part of nature itself. Anybody ever watched a, a baby chick like be birthed out of an egg? You know, maybe back in elementary school when you had that, you know, the little incubator and all that. Or maybe you've been on a farm or maybe you have chickens. I don't know. Some people have chickens. But what is like the first rule when a baby or a chick is being hatched out of an egg? What's the first rule that you shouldn't do? That's right. Don't help it. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. It's a part of its process of coming into the world that it has to have the ability and strength to actually break the egg away so that it can actually be born. I went on the internet and just typed in, you know, what should you do when a chick's being born? And in fact, people on the internet are ticked off about people <laughs> who mess with chicks and they're being born. Because the person, one person said, well, sure, mess with it if you want to have it have some kind of dis deformity or dis disability the rest of its life, or if you want to watch it die in your hands. I'm like, oh, wow, that's kind of brutal. But they're saying that because they understand that part of the process of the birth of that chick, it has to be able to strain and struggle and even suffer to find freedom from that egg. And the same thing is true of our lives. There's a process that God's not going to remove suffering from our lives because he's actually using it to develop in us things that would not be able to be developed apart from that suffering in us. So before we jump into the passage, I want to kind of highlight three specific things that hopefully will bring a little bit of clarity about what we're going to focus on today. When it comes to suffering, if you were to break suffering down into like the major categories of what causes suffering or the sources of su suffering in our life, there's three main ones. Okay, the first one is the category of stupidity. Okay, and that is that you and I do something stupid and we suffer the consequences. Anybody admit that's ever happened to you? Okay, that's that. And don't point to the person next to you. I just saw that. Okay, answer for yourself only. But you do something and then the consequences come and you suffer as a result of that. Okay, there's a second reality of suffering, a source of it, and that is it's a part of being human. And that means all of us, because we're human, at one time or another, we will go through a short season or a long season of suffering of some kind in our lives. And then there's a third category that, that Paul really dials in on today, and that is suffering for choosing to follow Jesus in your life. It's called persecution. Now, when we look at the passage, when, we, when Paul talks about suffering, this is the kind of suffering he's talking about. But way, the way he approaches suffering, we can apply what he says about suffering from persecution to what it is to suffer as a part of the human condition. I don't think you can take this passage and apply it to suffering as caused by stupidity in our life, but that's a whole other message, okay? But so this morning, because the reason I say that is that majority of us in our lifetime will not experience persecution for our faith, just because of the nature of the country that we live in, and we have freedom. Now, there's a benefit to that, but obviously, what Paul's dialing in on is a group of people that have experienced this. But in some, in, in, in some circumstance, maybe in the future, in our own country, or maybe if you do travel somewhere else and maybe you become a missionary, you may actually suffer for your faith. And at that point, you're going to want to run to these verses to remind you, how do I navigate and trust God in the midst of suffering in my life? But this is what well can be applied to our human condition. So with that understanding, if you have your Bibles, let me read verse 27. 
down to verse 30 of Philippians chapter 1 as Paul writes this. He says in verse 27, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Here's verse 29. Ready? Here it is. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engage in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So with those verses, Paul highlights things I want to walk through this morning that help us to understand how do we strive in the midst of suffering? How do we transcend the circumstances? We don't run from or deny that we're in suffering, but how do we get beyond those things controlling our lives? Paul highlights a number of things. Look at verse 27. The first reality that he shares with us is to remember something, and that is that you and I have to remember who we are. We have a tendency to forget we are. And some of us don't even know really who we are to begin with. So forgetting it even isn't even part of the equation. But remembering who we are, Paul says this. He says the first part of verse 27. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now he chooses, always chooses his words intentionally. And when he chooses the word manner, the way in which you live your life, it's the, it's the word that has the connotation of citizenship. So what he's saying is live as though there's citizenship that you have that is not in this world, but is tied to the gospel of who Jesus is. So what is Paul saying? And this is the shift that's hard for us. The only context we know is being human and living in this world, but what Paul is saying is when you say yes to Jesus, your citizenship changes. You automatically go, become, go from being a citizen of this world to being a foreigner in this world. And that's an important shift for us to understand. Because when you live as a foreigner, you'd live differently than if you're native to that country. Because when you live at home, in the place that you call home, you live in a way of, of understanding culture, customs, laws, language, food, all those kinds of things. You understand it's normal. In fact, on a daily basis, you don't even give much thought about it because it's just normal. But when you travel to another country where you are a foreigner, you think about everything. You think about how, what you don't understand about language, about why they eat strange food, about why the weather is so different than where you're from, and why people speak different languages, and they look different to you, and so you feel a little bit out of place. See, what Paul's saying is the, the way that you and I can navigate suffering is to understand that we are, we are citizens of eternity, not citizens of this earth. And the reason that's important is because you and I think that this lifetime is really all that there is. We give very little thought to the reality of eternity, which is forever. And when you and I get to eternity, whatever suffering you and I experience in this life, we'll look back and think, oh, that was a short period of time. And if you, the shift comes in your mind that, okay, I don't belong here. This is foreign. I can, I can put up with this for a while, and then eventually I will go home where suffering will no longer be a part of the equation because I won't, I won't be a foreigner anymore. I will be a citizen. So you can think about it if you've ever traveled. So I've talked about going to Uganda. Uganda is a beautiful country. I love Uganda, and I'll I'm going to go back to Uganda and have connections there. But I'll tell you, Uganda is not the United States. Not even close. In fact, it's very different in everything about it. Its language is different. Its food is different. The weather is very different. It's more like Haiti's climate, which is super hot, lots of humidity. It's got a lot of natural beauty to it, but it's just a different place. Um, we bag and get frustrated with our government, but talk about corruption. The government in Uganda is corrupt. And so you have all these dynamics going on in Uganda. And so when you go there, you really feel the weight of being a foreigner because you don't know the way things work. I mean, there's armed soldiers, there's checkpoints, there's all this stuff, stuff that we don't see on an ongoing basis. And so you have to realize that, that while you're there, you're going to live differently. And sometimes har life is harder there. So I think I've shared this before, but one of the time, one of the, one of the places that we were, in, we were staying, we, we didn't get the benefit of like, you know, a nice house with air conditioning and, you know, we basically got a cinder block room, four walls with a window with no, sh no screen, no nothing, just, and a roof over our head, that was it, and it was literally all night long, it was 85 degrees with 90% humidity, with no moving air. And it just so happened that one of our teammates decided to leave his mosquito net four hours away in the last place that we had stayed. 
So Kim and I, knowing that all of us need a mosquito net because the mosquitoes are really active in that area of Uganda, we made a commitment and we decided to stay in our one, we had each had our own mosquito net tent, but we stayed in one tent that was made for one person with the two of us so our other teammate could have mosquito net. It was the most miserable night of my life. Just so you know, nothing romantic about spending the night with your wife in a mosquito net in those kind of conditions, okay? You don't want to be anywhere near each other. And if you've ever had a mosquito net around you, you don't lean up against the mosquito net or sleep against it because mosquitoes will bite right through the net. They're pretty smart. So when you're laying there in a tent made for one, literally a narrow tent, you can't lean up against the side where the net is because you'll get bitten. And you don't want to lean towards the middle because you're sweating so much. You don't want to touch each other. And all night long, we're like, stop touching me. You're too close to me. I'm touching the net. Move over. I need more space. All night long. We didn't, neither, neither Kim and I slept at all. It was miserable. But I'm laying there in the middle of the night thinking, I can't wait to get on a plane and fly home and go into my air-conditioned house, into my nice bedroom that has windows with screens and a comfortable bed. And even though I love my, life, my wife, it's a queen bed, and she can have her side, and I can have my side, and the suffering will be over, right? <laughs> Seriously, I had to convince myself a few times in Uganda, this is temporary, this is temporary, this is temporary. I love to travel. I'll go back to Uganda, but I know I'm more comfortable when I'm here. That's what Paul's saying to us. If our perspective on suffering changes and we realize that being human and living on this planet, we are foreigners, that means that what we experience is only temporary because what is eternal doesn't include suffering anymore. And if you and I have that reality in our lives, then it changes the way we walk through suffering. Second thing, going on in verse 27, striving through suffering also means to stand up instead of sitting down. When you and I face suffering, Paul says this, he says, I, that I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. The phrase standing firm has to do with holding on to something, not backing down, even at personal cost to you. That means being willing to do whatever it takes to stand in the midst of suffering instead of what? Caving into it. It doesn't mean that you and I have some kind of positive thinking and think, okay, I'm not really suffering. It's not denying suffering. It's standing up in the middle of it and saying, I'm not going to let this control my life. I'm not going to give in to the suffering I'm experiencing. I'm going to push back against the suffering. I'm going to stand up. And why is that important? Because you and I, will, if we understand that the way that the enemy works in our life is that he will also take the opportunity of suffering to cause you and I to become discouraged and on top of that, to get mad at God for allowing suffering in our life. And that comes out in the form of bitterness to towards God. You don't have to raise your hand, but I think all of us in one time or another in our life, we've looked at God and said, this is not fair. Now, when was the last time you looked at somebody else and said, it's not fair when they're gone through suffering? But it's always not fair when we're going through suffering, right? When our enemies go through suffering, oh, that's fair. <laughs> that's justice. Why is that? It's because inside of us, we, we, we're, we're giving in and becoming victims to our own suffering when God says, no, you're supposed to stand in the midst of that. You're supposed to stand against it and not give in to it. The reason Paul's saying that is, remember, he's, he's experiencing suffering, and he's speaking to a people who, uh, who's experiencing suffering. And can you imagine what it looked like if they caved into the suffering of persecution? You and I may not be here today. The church might have gone extinct, but they stood up in the face of suffering because they knew that God ultimately was going to work in their suffering and through their suffering. It takes courage to suffer. It takes courage to stand up in the midst of suffering. And sometimes you and I have to be reminded. In fact, listen to what Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39 says. The writer of Hebrews says, but we are not those of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but are of those who believe and are saved. We don't shrink back. We don't pull back from suffering in our lives. But what do we do? We stand. There's something powerful about the concept of standing in the midst of something, standing against. That's why if you were in Ephesians chapter six and Paul talks about the armor of God, after he unpacks all of that, do you remember his statement? He says, when everything else is done, you do what? Stand. That means you're standing against the opposition that's coming your way. And it's important because you'll be in circumstances when everybody else around you is sitting and caving in and giving in, and you're the only one that's willing to stand. And it may come at personal cost, but you have to be willing to do that. In fact, take a look at this, this short clip. This is a, a clip from the movie Pearl Harbor. And there's a scene just after Pearl Harbor's been bombed and Roosevelt has gathered all his advisors around and he's trying to hear from the military what are our options. He wants to strike at the heart of Japan. And they're all saying, there's no way we're getting to the heart of Japan. We can't do this. And this is his response to what they say to him. Let's take a look at this. Gentlemen, 
Most of you did not know me when I had the use of my legs. I was strong and proud and arrogant. Now I wonder every hour of my life why God put me into this chair. But when I see defeat in the eyes of my countrymen, in your eyes right now, I start to think that maybe he brought me down for times like these when we all need to be reminded who we truly are, that we will not give up or give in. Mr. President, with all respect, sir, what you're asking can't be done. Get back, George. Get back. Do not tell me it can't be done. So when you think about standing your life, some of, and I, I can't pretend to understand the kind of suffering that, that is, has happened in, in your life and, and those who are represented in this room, but suffer, well, standing in the midst of suffering doesn't mean that you don't suffer. Standing in the midst of suffering is that you don't become a victim of your suffering. Because part of what happens is when we suffer, when we take suffering on as an identity, we become a victim of it. And then we can't live beyond it because it tells us what we can and cannot do as opposed to listening to God's voice and saying, seeing what God is doing in the midst of our suffering. So Paul makes this really strong statement about standing. And then there's a third thing. Look at going on to the last part of verse 27, and that is striving through suffering means that you and I contend together instead of competing against. So the last part of verse 27, Paul says, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Again, Paul chooses his words specifically and wisely the word striving has to do with competing normally competing against but in this context he changes it and it's competing alongside that means that when you go through suffering those who are around you are not your enemy they're your support system you're not working against them you're working with them why would paul say this because sometimes when pressure is applied what do we do we turn on each other and so when we're bitter and upset about suffering in our life, anybody who's around us becomes the lightning rod for our bitterness, and we get angry at them, and we turn on them. And therefore, they become our enemies instead of being what? Partners, they, we, we're competing now against them instead of working together side by side. This is important that Paul would say this to a group of people who are experiencing suffering in their life. Ever gone through a bad time or a bad season or suffered a bad day, and you come home and somebody at home catches it because you had a bad day? Pastors have bad days too, I can be honest. And you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? Well, you're just a lightning rod because I feel like I'm suffering and I'm the victim of my suffering, so I'm gonna take it out on you. But you know what's interesting about the church? This is not true all the time, but it's true most of the time. You know when the church is most unified? When there's persecution. Because when, when, when there's persecution, that we're reminded that we're all on the same team here. We're not working against each other. And sometimes when, when things are easy and things are comfortable, we have a tendency to separate. We have a tendency to split. We have a tendency to kind of do our own thing. And then what happens is there's this competition that kicks in in our lives. And we start working against each other instead of working for each other. But what Paul's saying in this is there has to be unity because unity helps us to understand we all have a common enemy, and that enemy is not the other person. The enemy is the enemy. Sadly, but rightly, you know the most unifying day, one of the most unifying days in the history of our country? Anybody remember what that day was? 9-11. It was 9-11, which is one of the worst days in our, in our country's history. But what happened is when terrorists struck at the core of who we are, all of the political affiliations and the arguments and the languages and skin colors and differences that people had just fell to the side. Why? because we all had a common enemy. We stopped turning on each other and we started working together. There's something to be said about, not, we don't pray for persecution. Okay, God, bring persecution, there can be unity in the church, but there's a warning to us that the, the reason that sometimes there's division, and that's why what's interesting, when you travel to countries where there's persecution, they don't care so much about denominations. They don't. They don't ask you what denomination you're from. They just want to know, do you love Jesus? Jesus. 
and have you given everything? Are you suffering for him? We get all crazy about denominations and theologies and practices and styles and all this stuff. And most of the rest of the world under persecution, they just want to know, do you know Jesus? That's the bottom line. And why is that important? Because what do we do in our culture, not just within the church, but the church in general, is that, believe it or not, it's hard to be unified. And we'll talk the next couple of weeks, Paul leans into unity. But to be unified when we're, we're competing with each other. Churches in the body of Christ compete with each other. And we say that we're competing for people who don't know Jesus, but the reality is we're just catering to people who know Jesus and have become disgruntled with the church they were at. Happens all the time. The majority of growth in the church has been transfer growth over the last decade. The numbers of churches going up and churches going down had really very little to do with the culture and everything to do with the migration of church folk. And we think, oh, wow, like we're winning because we've got a bigger church. No, 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 no. There's no winning. Winning is when the church gets bigger because people who didn't know Jesus found him. That's when we win. And if one church wins in that, we all win. If one church suffers, we all suffer. Why? Because we're all on the same team. Sometimes we have to be reminded of that. Sometimes maybe, maybe God will, and this is the thing I've been thinking about. I've been listening to a lot of some different Christian leaders. The church used to have favorite status in our culture in America. Literally, favorite status in everything. It's not true anymore. You know what? We've gone from favorite to margins. Now we're pushed to the margins of our culture, so people don't listen to the church like they, they used to. You know what the next step, when you go from favored to being marginal, you know what the next step is? Persecution. It's not only do we don't listen to you and you're irrelevant, but now actually we're going to go against you. Now I'm not, that's not some prophetic word that I feel like God has given me, but there is this, this bent in our culture that's moving that direction. So this passage is really, really important for us to understand about what it looks like in suffering. Then the, the fourth reality of striving through suffering is that you and I have to understand that we don't let fear get the best of us. So Paul goes on in verse 28, and he says, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Paul, again, uses the word frightened specifically to describe what he sees in somebody who reacts to fear. The word frightened was used to describe a horse that gets spooked. It gets spooked by something that it reacts to, but in reality, whatever it's reacting to is not as big as it should react. It, it overreacts to what it spooks it. So Paul's saying, listen, suffering's bad, but when suffering comes, don't let fear paint an artificial picture of how big that suffering is and control your life. Now remember, who's writing this? This is Paul who has suffered more than anybody for following Jesus, and he's saying, hey, don't get spooked. That's, that carries a lot of weight. This is a guy who's been beaten and whipped and stoned and suffered all kinds of stuff. And he says, hey, don't get spooked by suffering. It's part of human nature. It's part of following Jesus. But don't let it frighten you because why? When fear sets in, you know what the next step after fear is? Panic. And most of us, probably 95% of us, cannot make a good decision when we're panicked. We react and we don't see reality clearly. Why? Because fear has clouded it. And what happens is when you and I make a, a response or we react in fear to suffering, you know what happens? We suffer more. And what's even worse is sometimes the decisions we make in panic cause other people around us to suffer more. Because we're reacting. We're not staying calm. calm Paul's just saying, calm down. Calm down. So let me put it this way. It's, it, what, what is fear and panic or what could it do? when it's done in a way that isn't calm but reacts. Take a look at this picture. I'm sure everybody knows what this is. U.S. Airways 1549, Captain Sullenberger. Anybody remember this story? You've seen the movie Sully. Okay, so this is an amazing story of a flight crew that stayed calm in extraordinary circumstances, had every right to freak out, but they didn't. You know, the plane lands on the Hudson, and it's an amazing story of over 150 lives being saved by a crew that kept their cool in a difficult situation. You know, this almost didn't happen. Not the, the landing and all that, but this, this heroic story almost didn't happen. You know why? The NTSB did a lot of research, and first, when it first came out, somebody, after the plane landed on the water, somebody went to one of the back exits and actually got it open partway. Now, right afterwards, somebody said it was a flight attendant. And they blamed a flight attendant for a while. And then the NTSB, in interviews and research, found out it was actually a passenger. When they hit the water, the passenger freaked out, thinking, we're going to sink, we're going to sink. So they ran to the closest exit, which was at the back of the plane. 
not understanding that even the NTSB said, listen, the plane would have floated for a long time because the amount of fuel that was in the fuel tanks and how much air was in the fuel tanks would have kept the plane above water for quite a long time. So water started entering in, and they said if the door would have been cracked any further, the plane would have sunk within minutes, and everyone would have been lost. Why? Because of panic. Because one person freaked out in a very difficult situation and almost cost over 150 people their lives. So Paul says in the same way, in suffering, don't freak out. It's tough. It's painful. It's hard. But when you panic and you are spooked, you will only cause more suffering for yourself and other people. So Paul says for us to remain calm. And then there's a fifth reality, and that is to strive in suffering, you and I have to realize our resistance actually brings release. When we stand in the midst of suffering, something happens. Paul says this in verse 28 going on. He says, this is a clear sign. When you are standing, you're not freaking out. You're being calm and you stand in the midst of suffering. It's a clear sign to them, which is your enemies, of their destruction. But for you, it's your salvation and that from God. Paul is saying if you, comp- ca- you have the capacity to stand within suffering and to remain calm, that is a sign to you that God is at work in you, thus your salvation, and a sign to those who are against you, there's something different about you, that fi- there will not be victory for them in your suffering. Why is that important? Because the enemy takes the opportunity for the suffering in our lives to push us away from God. He does. He uses it just like God uses it to develop it. I think us, the enemy, uses it to push us away from God. But you and I have to be reminded of of something very important. There are times when you will stand for things in your life that you believe God is doing, and it may cause you to have to endure suffering. Because you are standing in what you know God is doing in your life or what God says is true, and because of that, you're getting pushback. And here's the danger, not only from the outside— people who maybe don't even know Jesus, but this happens from the inside. Remember what Paul said a couple passages ago? He said that there are people actually preaching Christ out of selfish ambition, people doing the right thing for the wrong motives. The people that should be on his team were, were, were pretending to be on his team, so it almost felt like his persecution wasn't just coming from the Roman government, it was coming from other people who were almost inside the church. So if you think about that, that means that there are times when there may be persecution in your life, pushback that you're going to get from people who should be on the same team with you. Because they're responding with fear. They're becoming victims of their own suffering. And you're standing up in the midst of it and saying, no, God is at work here. See, that happens all the time. In fact, it happened way back in the Old Testament. Anybody remember the story of Israel? They come out of Egypt. And God, pretty quickly after they, they, go, they cross the Red Sea, God pretty quickly brings them to the doorstep of the promised land. And then Moses sends in spies. He spends, sends in 12 spies. And when they come back and they give this report to all of Israel, and the report is 10 of them saw the land and said, we cannot do this. There's giants. There's fortified cities. There's no way we're going to overcome the land. We should just stay back and not risk anything. And then if you remember, there's two guys, Caleb and Joshua. And remember, Caleb said, we can do this. This is what God wants for us. If you read the story and the narrative that quickly from their report, literally within a few verses, all of Israel turns on them and wants to kill them because they believe that God can actually do something. They want to believe the 10 spies are like, oh, they're thinking, don't be crazy. We're, I mean, this is the same group of people that God literally parted the, the Red Sea and they walked on dry land and they're thinking, well, God can't overcome the fortified cities or the giants. So here's the reality. Caleb and Joshua stand and don't let fear control them. The tragedy for the 10 spies is their entire, all of their families and that entire generation pass away in the next 40 years as Israel wanders the desert. And then what happens? They get into the promised land and who, is, who are the first ones in? Caleb and Joshua and their families. In fact, Caleb is now 85 years old. And I love Caleb because he's still as nasty as ever. He's ready to pick a fight at 85. Why? Because he believes that God can do something, even if it means he, he was ready to die for giving a good report about what God could do through his people. There will be times in your life where you're going to make a stand, and, and be careful. It may be that your persecution, your pushback may come from people that you don't expect to come from. Because I think sometimes some of the most destructive persecution is what happens inside the church, not outside the church. Sometimes we crucify our own 
and we shouldn't because we've lost sight of what, what God may be doing. Listen to what James, as a reminder, says to us in James 4, verse 7. He says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. And what does he do? He will flee from you. See, if you don't resist and you give in, just like the spies gave in, then you're playing into the hand of the enemy. Now you're doing his will and you're doing his work. Then there's two more things. Look at verse 29. Here it is. Everybody's favorite verse. Everyone's life verse. The next thing you and I have to understand about striving and suffering is that except that faith and suffering are partners. Paul says, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Now, it, maybe you're like me. There are certain verses when you read them, you're like, couldn't you have left that one out? That would have been really helpful. But when you really understand what Paul is saying and from the perspective he's saying it from, I am so glad that that verse is in the Bible. And the reason why is one of the things that makes suffering bearable is if you know it's normal, it's common, it's going to happen. If you're like, I mean, if, if we don't let panic rule our lives, but, and we know something's coming, we're, we can respond better to it. And then for me, I always do better when I know something's coming. When I'm surprised, that's usually when I get spooked or when I get frightened and then I panic. But when I know, okay, it's coming. So I'm just going to be ready for it. It's going to come, and then I'm going to endure it, and then I'm going to get through it, I'm going to get to the other side. I can do this. So I've been to China a couple times, and I didn't know this, but my dad, who's flown all over the world like a million times, knows this. And so there's certain areas in the world where you fly, there's usually going to be rough air, turbulence. Uh, I, don't, I, like, I don't die when there's turbulence, but I prefer, prefer nice, smooth air. My, my wife, on the other hand, she says the rougher, the better. She's like, I'm on a roller coaster. I love, I'm like, no, not me. So anybody like me, you like smooth air, you know, like turbulence, like make you a little bit concerned, like, are we safe? You know, that kind of thing. So, but flying to China, when you, when you come over kind of Korea, Japan area, that's historically, there's rough air there. So a lot of times you'll go through an extended period of turbulence. And so now when we flew to China the first time, my dad knows the area and he's flown a lot there. And so I had no idea, but I didn't know that. This is like a 13 and a half hour flight. So we're like, I don't know, nine or 10 hours in or whatever it is. And we hit some bumpy air, and I'm like, oh, this will pass in five minutes, and it went on for 45 minutes to an hour, and it was really, it was the kind of bumpy air where like, you know, ding, the seatbelt sign goes on, the captain comes over and says, hey, if you're up in the cab, would you go ahead and sit down? It's going to be a little bumpy. I'm like, I don't like that. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, man, this is rough. When's it going to end? Finally, 45 minutes, an hour later, it ends, and I'm like, whew, we got through that, and I looked at my dad. I said, that was rough, and this is the response. He goes, oh, that wasn't rough. I'm like, it can get worse than that? That's what I'm thinking in my mind. He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I've flown out over this area before. And he said, there was one flight that we had three and a half hours of solid turbulence. He goes, people were throwing up all over the plane. I'm like, oh, my, I guess it can be worse. But it was interesting. The second time I flew to China, we got over that same area because I'm watching the GPS, you know, to track her to see her out. I'm like, I know what's coming. And we hit turbulence again, and it lasted probably about the same amount of time. And I'm like, I can do this, because I know eventually it's going to end. Eventually, we're going to get to where we're supposed to go. And I knew it was coming, so in my mind, I kept thinking, okay, when we get to about this part of the flight, it's going to happen. If it happens, I'm going to be okay. I made it through once before. I can make it through again. And somehow, suffering and the turbulence wasn't that bad. Paul puts this verse in. God inspires it through the Holy Spirit to remind you and I, our faith and suffering work together, and it's going to happen. And you and I need to be aware it's coming because then we can be prepared. And when it happens, it doesn't freak us out. Why? Because God said this is going to happen. This is going to be a part of my faith to know that I'm going to experience suffering in my life. And then the final thing is this. And the worship team will join us for one last song. Striving through suffering means that suffering is something that we all face. Paul says in verse 30, he says, He's engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So Paul's saying, remember, we've talked about this. I'm in this struggle, and as he's writing this book, you will see they are in the same struggle that Paul's in. He's reminding them of the struggle he's in, and they know it because this is common to them as well. This is something they're all experiencing. So is isn't like Paul's saying, oh, now when you go through suffering, no, he's saying you're going through suffering like I'm going through suffering, which you've heard, because Paul's life, once he said yes to Jesus, was a series of sufferings. But this is a reminder that, that all of us go through suffering. Not one human being in their lifetime will ever be exempt from suffering. All of us go through it, whether it be suffering for your faith or suffering in the human condition. Why is that important? Remember I said it earlier, suffering is a guarantee, but the way we respond to suffering is not. And here's the challenge. 
I have watched this in the lives of people over and over and over and over again. When we suffer, when we struggle, when we go through hard times, our default is to isolate ourselves. We run. We pull back. We pull back from the very people who can support us and pray for us and care for us. We think somehow if I pull back in the midst of my suffering, I'll be able to figure this out on my own and nobody will really know how bad I'm suffering. I'll just pull back. I've watched it happen in our church. It's amazing. Someone will disappear and then they'll come back to church and they'll tell me the story of suffering they went through for the last three months. And I said, why didn't you say anything? Well, I'm just going to try to figure it out on my own. Why did you walk away from the people that love you the most and will care for you? I've watched this happen in our own community group. Somebody goes through suffering and they stop coming to community group because they're going to figure it out on their own. We pull back. This is the exact opposite of what Paul is saying and experiencing. When you and I suffer, we shouldn't pull back and isolate. We should lean in. Why? Because the enemy does his best work when you live in isolation. That's where he works. There's a reason Jesus uses the analogy of sheep to describe his followers. There's a number of them. One of them is that we're not too bright, okay? But another one is because sheep do better in herds. When one gets isolated, Jesus talked about that. When, you know, there's the one and there's the 99, the one is exposed and he's vulnerable or she's vulnerable, what? To attack. So why in the world, when we go through suffering, do we pull back from the herd and think, I'm going to figure this out on my own? Now, the enemy has, exa- has you exactly where he wants you. And your suffering will be greater because you isolated. Guarantee it. I've seen it every single time. Why do we do that? Why do we isolate? I figured it out in my life because I do it too. You know why we isolate ourselves when we suffer? Because of shame. And shame says to you and I, I'm not good enough, I don't match up, I have problems, and I don't want anyone to know. So shame pushes us back. That's what what happens. And so when we feel like, if I say that I'm in need or I'm struggling or I'm going through something, then people are going to think, I'm not perfect. Wow, we all are not perfect, right? Right? but that's what our minds think. I don't want to admit that I have a problem. I don't want to admit that I'm struggling. I don't want to admit that I'm suffering from addiction. I don't want to admit that I have cancer. I don't want to admit that I'm going through a family difficulty. I don't want to admit any of that. Why? Because people might realize that I'm not perfect. That's shame. And shame is what will kill you. So let me put it in this context. Take a look at this picture. Anybody ever seen one of these before? That's a service bell. Probably you've seen that if you've walked into certain restaurants or maybe you go into a hotel and nobody's at the desk, and so there's, it says what, ring the bell for service, right? And so if no one's there, you're supposed to ring the bell so that someone can come and help you. You know what? Majority of us, by steady, this is true, majority of us don't like to ring that bell. We don't. In fact, it's been shown, and I I know this is true for me, you see a bell, and you want help, but you don't want to ring the bell, so what do you do? (coughs) You cough, you sneeze, you hit the table, right? Anybody would admit you've ever done that before. Why? Because if I ring the bell, then everybody's going to know I need help, and I don't want anybody to know I need help. So you're going to ring the bell. It's silly. It's ridiculous. The bell's there for you to ring so that you can get help. But you don't want people to know that you need help. We don't ring the bell in our lives either. We're afraid to ring the bell. The church is the place where the bell should be going off all the time. But what do we do? No, I'm just going to slip out the back. I'm just going to disengage. I'm going to stop attending. I'm going to stop connecting in community groups. I'm just, I'm just going to pull back because I don't want people to know what's true of all of us, which is all of us need help. It's okay to ring the bell. In fact, this is really interesting. Kim and I went to a conference a couple weeks ago. It was just senior pastors. The topic, shame. Because senior pastors deal with shame all the time. The internal dialogue in most of us is, I'm not good enough, I don't care for people enough, I'm not there for people enough, I don't preach good enough, and you go through all the list of things, and you just feel that sense of shame. And you know what that does to senior pastors? We never ring the bell. Because we don't want to know, we don't want people to know that we're inadequate, even though we are. And it was really interesting, at that conference, there was probably eight or nine tables set up in this room, and they were all filled with pastors, and there was a bell sitting at the center of every table. 
And they said, during your discussion times, when you're talking and you reach a point where you know that you're now exposing the fact that you have needs, ring the bell. The first round of discussion, it was relatively quiet in the room, but as the day went on, ding, ding, ding. And it was interesting, by the end of the day, when you'd hear the bell go off, people would start, start applauding. Thank you for admitting that you have a need and you're ringing the bell so someone can pray for you and support you. When you and I go through suffering, you're supposed to ring the bell. I need you to hear that. You're supposed to ring the bell. Don't think that you're just stronger and you got more courage because you're going to go figure it out on your own. No, the enemy is going to whoop you. He's going to win in your life. He's going to destroy what God's doing because your pride won't say, I need help. God has created the church to be an environment in relationship where we lean on each other. That's why Paul says also that we are supposed to do what? Bear each other's burdens. Why? Because they're too heavy to carry alone. So God has said to us, ring the bell. In suffering, use the support system that you have. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. The team's going to come and lead us in one last song as we close. This morning, it's important that you and I learn from Paul's writings that although we may not suffer specifically for our faith, we do experience suffering from our own human experience. And yes, we know that the church is not perfect, and I know even some here might say, well, I, I did ring the bell at one point, and I didn't feel like people cared for me, and I, I apologize on behalf of this church or any church if you felt that. But one of the realities of, of care is that you have to establish relationship in order to give and receive care in your life. So maybe one of the reasons you haven't been able to be cared for is because you haven't invested in the relationship with people around you. You haven't been a part of a community group or had friends that support you. And it may require for you to invest in relationship. But, but others, and probably the majority of us, if you struggle through suffering and you struggle through isolation, I think there's a wake-up call that God is giving you today. He's saying, it's time for you to get over your pride. It's time for you to get beyond your shame. Because everyone around you suffers. And everyone around you, you would be amazed if everybody were to tell their story how many things you have in common with a person sitting next to you or sitting a row over from you or sitting across the sanctuary this morning. You have experienced pain and suffering just like everybody else in the room. But Jesus has given us an answer and it comes in two forms. The first one is to lean on each other. When we go through suffering is to be honest and transparent and say, I need help. But the second and probably most important is that Jesus has given us him, himself, through his spirit who lives inside of us, who understands the pain and the suffering. And Jesus himself knows suffering more than anyone. And because of that, you and I could cry out and call out to God in the midst of our suffering for Jesus to show up and to work in our lives. And in doing that, we are ringing the bell not only for each other, we're ringing the bell for Jesus. Jesus, I need help. Jesus, I'm going through difficulty. And Jesus, because he experienced pain and suffering and even was tempted as we are tempted yet did it without sin, he understands where you're at. But today he wants you to call out to him. So Jesus, as we sing this last song, I pray that you would hear our hearts. You know the journeys that each of us are experiencing, the pain and suffering that we have gone through or in the past or even presently. But we know, Lord, that you have given us the answer to our suffering, and that is to lean on those around us. But Lord, is to call out to you. Lord Jesus, we need you today. So as we pray in our, in, in our worship and conclusion today, I pray that your spirit would come in a way that would bring comfort in the midst of our suffering, would bring clarity to our hearts and our minds, would give us calm where we want to panic and freak out, and give us the courage and strength to stand up in the face of our suffering as we lean on you and lean on others to bring relief. We thank you, Jesus, in your name.